Uh, Charles has been a kind of a transatlantic boomerang of sorts. So he started his education in America in Boston at Boston University, came to Oxford to study for a, in the Rhodes Scholars Program, went back to Boston at a certain point to get his MBA at Harvard, and now is back here at Oxford um, as the warden of Rhodes House. For those of you who are not Oxonians, you might think that he's a jailer, but that is not true. Um, the warden is, a, is the person who runs the Rhodes Scholarship Program. So Charles is in charge of the most prestigious scholarship program here at the university, or one of the most prestigious for sure. Um, his experience is, is wide ranging. He's been an entrepreneur. Um, he's been a, a partner at McKinsey. He's a board member at Patagonia and a number of other firms. He's an advisor to philanthropists. And he is now my colleague as of this summer. Welcome. Back to Oxford, Charles. Good afternoon, everybody. And um, thank you very much, Peter, for asking me to come today. It is um, a great honor to be here um, in, the, in the presence of this fine group of people. I, um, I was uh, reminiscing with them last night. It's the first time I've seen uh, Clayton or Dean Clark in a very long time. I'm sorry, I'm still gonna call you Dean Clark even though now you're President Clark. Uh, I don't remember all the details, but the first time I remember being in a room with them was probably more than 20 years ago. And both Clayton and I had been awarded the Dean's Doctoral Fellowship uh, at, at Harvard and we found ourselves in Professor Clark's office at the same time. And I was de deliberating whether or not to stay and do the PhD uh, and had probably come to talk to them about that. And, and I remember sitting there listening first to Clay talk about his research ideas and, and being in his presence and listening to his ideas, I felt uh, an intellectual and physical hobbit uh, and, and in the end decided not to do the PhD. <laughs> Clayton went on and, uh, Clayton went on and, and wrote about uh, uh, technology disruption and I went and lived it as a technology entrepreneur. I think he had the better of it uh, for sure. Um, Appropriately enough, Peter has asked us to come and talk about responsible leadership. Um, as the new head of the Rhodes Program, I've been ruminating a lot about responsible leadership. It's, it's pr pretty much my job. A as Peter said, I'm also director of Patagonia, the outdoor clothing company. And one of the things I spend my time thinking about is, is the contrast between Cecil Rhodes, who was the founder of the Rhodes Scholarships 110 years ago, and Yvonne Chouinard, who's the founder of Patagonia. And, and I know you couldn't imagine two more different people, and I, I think that's kind of the point. Um, as many of you know, Rhodes established uh, the Rhodes Scholarships. And, and, and maybe you don't know that it was really the first of its kind. And he was explicitly trying to develop young leaders to do what he called fight the world's fight, which meant for him um, to encourage relationships among countries and to make the world a better place. And uh, Pretty, pretty good stuff so far, right? Um, his criteria were really interesting. Rather than just picking intellectuals, uh, he wanted to pick people who had a devotion to truth, uh, courage, and caring for others. Um, he also wanted people who had an energy and ambition to develop their talents. And he wanted people, most of all, who, who had what he called moral force of character and the instinct to lead. Uh, and all of that sounds a lot like an ambition to responsible leadership, and, and, and I think it was. And it produced some, it has produced some amazing leaders. Uh, pr probably today in Australia, it produced Prime Minister Tony Abbott. Um, we'll see, I guess, when the votes are all counted. Uh, Bill Clinton, Bob Hawke, Norman Manley in, in Jamaica, Cory Booker um, in New Jersey, and, and many others. Um, I thought it might be fun to look at uh, Cecil Rhodes today, partly because Clayton Christensen is a Rhodes Scholar, uh, and, and, and just to sort of think back, what, what, what can we learn about the difference between effective leaders and responsible leaders by looking at Rhodes and then looking at some others? Um, Rhodes was an amazing entrepreneur and business person. And when I say amazing, imagine that by age 48, he had started two companies that are still with us today, uh, De Beers and Goldfields. Two countries that are still with us today, they have different names now, Zambia and Zimbabwe, and had been prime minister of a third, uh, all, all before 48, and then he promptly keeled over and died. Uh, but but a, 
by any uh, definition, a remarkably effective leader. But history hasn't judged him to be a responsible leader, and I thought it might be interesting to talk about why. Um, amazing breadth of vision, clearly, and many of the characteristics that we do think of as good in leaders. He was a person uh, of really big ideas. He wasn't a scholar, uh, may, maybe surprisingly. Um, big ideas and big ideals, uh, rather than about personal gain. In fact, the, the only book he carried with him, and he carried it with him all the time, was Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, which for those of you who don't know, it is a, is a Stoic text. And one of the things it propounds is basically stripping away all of your personal concerns and developing a conception of the cosmos as all present and, and at the same time encompassing all time. Um, uh, and none of that is about personal gain. And we'll come and talk about it in, in a minute. Not at all centered on self. One of the big principles and ideas that he was guided by um, was the idea of British values and British empire. And today we might think of empire as somewhere between bad and silly. But one thing Peter asked us to do as, as we prepared for this talk is to think about where is responsibility context or culture or history specific. And here we might say that it was. Rhodes's ideas and ideals were shared by many, if not all of his countrymen of the day. So we'll set aside for now our, our view that empire might be a silly, a silly idea. It was, it was a powerful idea in his time. He painted a large vision for Africa that captured the attention of others. He, he, he built followership, followership of thousands uh, based on his leadership and inspired many people. He's famous for saying uh, to Countess Warwick to right toward the end of his life, that w when she accused him of being a dreamer, uh, the following quote, which is, it is the, the dreamers that move the world. Practical men are so busy being practical that they cannot see beyond their own lifetimes. Dreamers and visionaries have made civilizations. If there, if, if there had been no dream, we'd still be living in caves and clubbing each other to death over a mouthful of food. And, and the only reason I, I recount it is, this is, a, again, a, a person with a big vision, definitely far beyond his life. He was also a great judge of people. Um, he surrounded himself by those who had a different skill set from his own, another characteristic of effective leaders, which included the strategist, Alfred Bight, the financier, Lord Rothschild, uh, the operator, uh, Charles Rudd, and he had enormous charisma to get these kinds of people to follow him, another characteristic of good leaders. But he was also a careful listener, and he drew these people out and incorporated his views, their views, into his view. Finally, he built uh, an enormous fortune, but he didn't give a whip for money at all. Uh, in fact, he, all, he owned almost nothing personal. He wore the same old hat. Uh, he wore the same rumpled clothes. He didn't even own a watch. And not until the end of his life did he even live in a proper house uh, or, or have a bed uh, any, any more than a cot. So, so he didn't do anything that he did, starting countries, starting companies, genuinely changing the face of the continent uh, for, for any gain in his own lifetime or, or any luxury. So today, we, we may not agree with the idea of building a bigger British empire and expanding uh, Queen Victoria's realm. But, it, but if we set that aside, why is he not viewed as a responsible leader? Uh, he was loved by those around him, uh, especially those closest to him. He was feted by the Queen, uh, and, he, and he was admired by both Britons and Africans during this period. And, and I, you know, I, I, think, I think many of us in the room do know the answer, and, and the answer does tie into some of the things that Kim spoke about a minute ago, which is um, while his ends were ends that many held, his means were not. Um, basically, Rhodes would do whatever was required to win his game, and his game was a big, was a big game and bigger than we typically talk about with, with companies today. He uh, told different people different things. That, that's lying. Um, he, <laughs> right, right. He, he, he manipulated shares uh, in stock exchanges in order to get more, more wealth, to, again, for, for, for ends, not for himself. Um, he even started small wars when, uh, when other forms of persuasion, like bribery, didn't work. Uh, and that's how we ended up with upper and lower Rhodesia, uh, which, we, which we talked about a minute ago. People were bullied, 
ruined, people died, um, and, and all while Rhodes pursued this vision, and he, uh, he was a friend of the queen. She thought what, what he was doing was a good thing. Um, it, in, in the end, of course, doesn't matter how great your aims are, what you do matters. And Mark Twain uh, has a wonderful saying about Rhodes, which was, he wants the earth and he wants it for his own. And the belief that he will get it and let his friends in on the ground floor is the secret that rivets so many eyes upon him and keeps him at the zenith where the view is unobstructed. I admire him, and frankly, I confess it, when his time comes, I shall buy a piece of the rope as a keepsake. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the, in, in the end, time caught up with Rhodes before any rope caught up with Rhodes. Um, but I thought, I thought Twain's uh, view was interesting. So uh, we, we can see the difference between being an incredibly effective leader and being a responsible and moral leader um, amounts to that our means are responsible, not just our ends, that we take account of the impact of our actions on other people and other legitimate aims, not just our own aims. And then mo most importantly, what, what Kant called the categorical imperative, that we don't use other people as means to our own ends, again, regardless of how those ends are. Before I finish, I, I do want to contrast Rhodes, you know, this historical character, with a living character who I get to work with uh, uh, many, day many days of the year. And that's Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia. Um, and I know it's a big segue to go from uh, from Empire to Patagonia, but you know Patagonia is a pretty successful company out there in the world. Many many of you may know it, um, and it's a story that's much less ground, sorry, grand, but it, it is grounded in in a genuine story of responsibility. Schwinnard is an environmentalist who happens to be very reluctantly a capitalist. Um, he he only became a capitalist because he wanted to make pitons that worked when he was mountain climbing and didn't fall out. Pretty simple. And then, and then he started the clothing company because uh, he needed a cash cow to pay for his trips to go climbing. L lit literally how it happened. But, but, it, but, but um, for him, the starting point is always nature, which he enjoys. And, and his view is that unless you sell organic seeds or night soil, anyone who doesn't know what night soil is can ask me after, that you are doing some environmental harm. And, and at, at an early point in the company's history, an epiphany came to them about how much harm even a good company like Patagonia was doing. And, and this is the lesson in, in responsibility. They found that even when they produced an organic cotton polo shirt, that it used 2,700 gallons of water and, 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 and burned 21 pounds of CO2 in its production and transportation and packaging. And that led to this fanatical pursuit inside the company of, uh, of a changes in the way they thought about the company and how they, how they made their products to be responsible. Not to be perfect, because he would still tell you today that Patagonia does harm, but it's their explicit goal to do no unnecessary harm. And I'm just going to talk about three things that they do, because I think it does matter. And, and, and it underscores being responsible is a lot more than having a great aim and thinking good thoughts, it's about what you do on the ground. The first is what they call the footprint chronicles, which is they looked at every single product they made, and they traced every single step of the product, and they, and, and they tried to root out any dangerous dyes, any improperly produced inputs, any uh, worker practices that were unfair or unethical. And so every single product of Patagonia doesn't get produced without that kind of an intensive um, uh, process. The second thing they did is recognizing not, even, not just producing good products was enough, that they needed to think about their customers' demand behaviors. Now, most companies want as much demand as they possibly can. At Patagonia, that isn't the case, uh, strangely. So they started something called Common Threads, where they're working to encourage the customer to uh, reduce what they purchase. The, the, the last campaign was called Don't Buy This Jacket. <laughs> <laughs> which literally was, please don't buy this unless you really need it, um, to, to uh, uh, repair products. So when you have something that's broken in Patagonia, they don't want you to throw it away. They want you to send it in for free to have it repaired. 
um, to recycle. So when you're done with, Patag with a Patagonia product, they want you to send it back because all those fibers get re reused. Uh, and, and, and then finally to recycle. Um, and th they actually recycle also via a big eBay store where if you're tired of what you have for Patagonia, they want you to send it there, donate any profit to charity so that other, other people can enjoy the clothes. And the third thing is the big thing we're working on in Patagonia right now, which is called the Hig Index, which is a way of taking both of these ideas from a single company, Patagonia, and making it at the scale of an industry. And so they're trying to create an index that measures the impact on both workers and the environment for every single piece of clothing that's produced by the people who are participants in the index, more than 300 companies from Walmart uh, to, to North Face and Patagonia. So they're trying to take their little practices that started in Patagonia and make it broad. So um, I, I guess the point I wanted to make about it is uh, Yvonne was actually, it is actually a lot like Rhodes. He cares about only one big thing and it's something that will never be achieved in our lifetime. And for him, of course, that's, that's saving the planet. He doesn't care about money. Chouinard wears an old pair of Walmart jeans. He won't even wear Patagonia jeans. They cost too much. <laughs> he drives the same Toyota Corolla that he's always had. He doesn't own a cell phone. He lives in the same house he's lived in for 40 years. Um, he, he's the same kind of curmudgeon uh, that Rhodes was. He doesn't have, he doesn't even have Rhodes' charm, <laughs> li li literally. Gr he's a grouchy son of a gun. But he is a responsible leader, and he's a responsible leader because not only does he try and make a great end, but he cares about all the steps along the way that are required to do it. So uh, thank, thank you very much for uh, uh, listening today. <laughs>